I need some traction. Hey, yes. folks. Thanks for tuning in. Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder of Traction and Boast AI. Exciting session today. As you're joining, introduce yourself. And the chat, I'm just enabling it for everyone. Introduce yourself to everyone, where you're tuning in from, what your company does, and what you're looking to get out of the session. Super stoked to have my friend Rajiv here. He's known as the heavyweight champion of story. He is the founder and chief pitch artist of startup hype man he helps startups not suck at telling their story and he was named agent of change by huffington post he's done a ted talk been featured in inc forbes and more he's also a hip-hop artist i think you have an album coming out right raj so funny enough this beat that's playing right now is one of the beats that's uh, that i'm rapping over on the new album Awesome. I got to get you to do a rap for Traction. Come live to the next Traction in person. Yeah. So hip hop artist, yoga instructor, and professional MMA ring announcer. So outside of how not to suck at telling your story, you can also talk to him about Hamilton, WWE, Seinfeld, or anything else. You have a friend for life. Awesome. Raj, take it away, my man. You have a great set of slides. You can rap, rap the whole thing. <laughs> but the man, the myth, the legend, Raj, take it away. You got a lot of people here from San Francisco, from Dubai. I live in Dubai now. I moved to Dubai a month ago after over, what, almost three decades around U.S. and Canada, the last 12 years in San Francisco. Awesome. Mexico, yeah. Miami, dude. People from all over here to learn how not to suck at telling their story. So my man, take it away. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate the introduction, Lloyd. Thank you to the Traction community for uh, having me today. Um, those of you who are introducing yourselves in the chat, please keep on doing that uh, if you just got in. Also, I'm curious to know like, what stage of company are you? Are you pre-seed? Are you seed? Are you series A? Are you series B? Are you beyond? Let's see where you're at as a company. I'm curious to know like, what kind of uh, audience we've got in the room today. Um, I will get a little bit further into my personal introduction uh, in a, uh, just a few minutes, but I want to welcome you all today to this training, this workshop that is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, and as the title has already told you what it is, I call it How to Not Suck at Pitching Your Startup. So we got a lot to cover today. Let's go ahead and dive right in. All right. So um, let's do a reset on that, everybody. A lot to uh, cover today, but what we're going to focus on specifically are, is the, the mindset and the formulas and strategies specifically around your elevator pitch, followed by very specific examples using the formulas and strategies we'll cover today. There is a part two of this workshop that is specifically dedicated to um, how to enhance your investor pitch deck to be able to like specifically on pitch decks when pitching investors. Time constraints cannot get through all of that today. However, as a follow up after this, what I'm going to send you is what I call the director's cut recording of this workshop. So it's a pre recorded version that quickly summarizes everything we're going through live today. And then also there's a full 20 ish minutes specifically on investor pitch decks. So you so just be on the lookout for after this, I'll get you the director's cut version of this uh, workshop. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into how to not suck at pitching your startup. Um, with myself, Raj Nation, and my company, Startup Hype Man. Um, I love just letting people know our mission with Startup Hype Man. You've probably heard nine out of 10 companies fail. You've probably also seen that women and minority-owned companies get like around 2% of venture funding. To me, all of this says it's an environment designed for failure. Um, the mission at Startup Hype Man is to use the power of story to make success inevitable and not the exception. And I like to say we can create a new reality where the three inevitables of life are that are death, taxes, and ultimately your startup making it along the way. And I think the more that companies, the more that founders, the more that startups focus on their storytelling ability and the stories that they tell, the, the more that becomes a real reality. 
So today is, in fact, that how to not suck at pitching your startup workshop. But what you didn't realize you were also walking into was a simulation of a live interactive game show that I like to call Pitch Your Startup. That's right. It's Pitch Your Startup, the only live interactive game show simulation where you on your side of the Zoom screen have to think live in real time in front of a room of your peers how you would, in fact, pitch your startup. So with this... If we were doing this as like a multi Zoom box situation, I would actually pick one of you to like go off of mute and uh, and actually come up and pitch because we, it's, a, it's a one way webinar. What I want to do is just I want to just take like a thirty second pause here, and I want you to actually out loud to your Zoom screen right on your side. You're on mute; doesn't matter to your own Zoom screen. If I ask you to pitch me, you know you can you can decide if I'm your target customer, if I'm an investor. If I say, hey, I'm going to put 60 seconds on the clock, go. I want you to say out loud what you would say right now. And again, I'm not going to be able to hear you, but I want you on your side of the screen to be able to do that, to, to say out loud. How are you going to pitch me? And again, I'm intentionally pausing and doing some silence here to give you an opportunity on your side to pitch me. And in this simulation, you don't have a deck. You just have 60 seconds. All right. I'll pause it there. Now, I'm curious here. If you, what did you do on your side of the screen? Did you think for a long time about what you wanted to say, and then maybe didn't get that many words out? Did you say to yourself, oh crap, what, do I, what am I supposed to say here? Did you say, oh, I'm not used to being put on the spot. Hmm, let me think about this. Did you go right into your pitch? Did you maybe stumble over your words a lot? Go ahead and in the chat, let me know like what, um, you know, what was your sort of like reaction on your side of the screen? Aaron says, struggle with the, the squinching eyes, sad, you know, frustrated emoji. Thomas went right into the pitch with a lot of stumbling as I got into it. Rose, right into the pitch. Cool, cool. A little tripping over the tongue. So keep bringing in those answers. What I think is really interesting is that <laughs> I nailed it and when you want to invest now, let's roll. <laughs> Leo was silent after 10 seconds. So what I think is interesting here is the majority of us are not ready for that moment, right? Um, and so, you know, like someone says, okay, pitch me. And it's like having to think about what you want to say. It's having to go through that initial moment of fear or like the tripping over the tongue or the frustration. That's how the majority of us experience that, right? Like Shane saying, stumble to wonder what the context was, what to highlight, uh, how to condense, Gerald saying, how to condense 10 minutes of background from a life science company into, into 60 seconds. So, I want you to know, obviously, you're not alone in this struggle, right? This is what the average entrepreneur faces every single day, this exact struggle. At the same time, even though you're not alone, I also want to highlight it's not okay to not be ready. And the reason is very simple. You're never going to have a scenario in which an investor or a potential customer walks up to you and says, hey, Gerald, you know what? Not right now. Uh, I see you're here. I just met you on the sidewalk here. Not right now, but tomorrow I want to meet you back in this exact spot. And then I want you to pitch me. Just give me that 24-hour heads up. So like, please do your homework, do your research, and then come back and I'll see you then, right? That just doesn't happen. So you always have to be ready to be put on the spot. Don't allow yourself to get away with, ooh, I'm not used to being put on the spot or I don't like being put on the spot. The other funny thing I see a lot of entrepreneurs do is they'll open by saying, well, what I would usually say is, and then they'll say something. And I, I'm telling you right now, if you preface your pitch by saying, well, what I would usually say is, I'm going to guess you never actually say the thing. And instead, every time you say what I would usually say is. So you're not alone, but it's not okay, and we want to work on fixing that. Here's proof that you're not alone. Today, as we talk through these pitch strategies, I want to actually, when we talk to the storytelling uh, advice, I want to actually tell you a story in the process of another founder. This is Carson Goodale. 
He was the co-founder and CEO at a company called FanFood. Now, he saw a very early version of this workshop many years ago. And afterwards, he was like, hey, Raj, like my pitch, it kind of sucks. Like, I think I need some help. Like, can you help me? And I was like, okay, well, let's see what you got. And I put him on camera and I said, okay, Carson, pitch me. Very similar to how I asked all of you to pitch me. And here's what Carson said. All righty, FanFood is a mobile concession app that allows fans at live events to order concessions from their phone. They can choose to have it delivered to their seat or they can pick it up through an express line. The value add for the end user, the fan, is that we're gonna maximize the user experience. The value add for the venue is that we're gonna increase the revenues in the per caps. Yeah, that's it. So. Eh. On a scale of one to 10 in the chat, how would you rank that? 10 being the best, obviously, and one being the worst. We got five, one, seven, six, five, seven, one, five, one, five, six, two, four. All right. So these scores are pretty all over the place. I think the majority are coming in at five or six or lower. Those of you who are given sevens or eights, I think you're being incredibly generous. I would give this about a two or a three for a few reasons. One, there's like no energy behind this whatsoever. I don't even get the sense that he likes his own company. Another reason is that the language was so buzzwordy, right? Like, he spoke about it in such a technical way. The value add for this user group is this. The value add for that user group is that. No one would conversationally talk like that. He also didn't know when he wanted to end. And by the end, he just looked off to the side and he goes, that's it. That's all I got. So was it concise? Sure. But did it deliver enough value or get you excited on the other side to want to learn more? I would say the answer to that is a resounding no. And so Carson was like, hey, like I could use some help with this. Like, what do we do? And so I was like, all right, let's get to work. I think we can do this. Now, I want to give you a little bit more window into my personal background at this point. Lloyd touched on it in his introduction of me. But um, the reason why I'm so passionate about all of this stuff uh, and really what drives me personally and professionally, uh, I have this deep rooted belief that everyone deserves a voice. And I really believe in the power of expression. And that's what drives everything, right? So Lloyd mentioned in the introduction, I am a hip hop artist. Uh, I'm actually, and I make a lot of startup and founder themed music. And coming out later this year is the official startup hype man mixtape. It's called Burn Rate. Uh, and that beat, for those of you who were on here early enough that we were playing at the beginning, that's one of the beats that I'm rapping over in the mixtape. So be on the lookout for Burn Rate, the official first ever startup founder themed mixtape. Uh, this idea of voice drives my, my, my passion through music. I'm also a yoga instructor. Uh, I'm also a professional ring announcer for MMA. Uh, and I've even brought that over as Lloyd knows he was on my podcast, uh, earlier this week. Uh, and I introduced him onto the podcast as if he was a MMA fighter entering the arena. Um, and then also it's obviously what drives the work here with startup hype, man. Uh, I started this company six years ago, six plus years ago. Um, and as our founder and chief pitch artist, the whole thing here is how do we, how do we help cr uh, create a voice? Because I believe that it is your, I think your, your your most distinguishing factor, your unique differentiator, isn't your IP. It's not your technology. It's not your, um, it's not your patents. It's actually your voice. And it's your job as a founder to articulate in such a way where your audience sees you not as the best, but as the only. Because companies who can position themselves as the only, can sh they get to shape the market in their image instead of being compared to everyone else. And so this belief, again, it, it, that's why we're here today. That's why I'm here today for you. Um, and it's, it's, it's been pervasive in the market. We've had a lot of opportunity with a lot of different companies um, across the globe in helping them raise a lot of capital, do a lot in sales along the way, win pitch competitions. We've been partnering with a lot of ecosystem leaders and featured in different platforms and everything. Um, and it's just been cool. And I, what's cool, I'm like the ring announcing thing, like, uh, I have the honor and the privilege of saying I have appeared on NBC sports before, uh, doing ring announcing, uh, which I'll tell you, like to this day, anytime I do think about that, I'm like, that's just like freaking crazy that that's happened in life before. Um, so all of this to say, like, I, again, I deeply care about voice and that's, that's what I want to help you with today. 
So I obviously think this is important. If you don't believe it, because I say it, I want you to believe it because these other important people say it. This guy here, his name is Raj Bhargava, coincidentally also named Raj. Uh, some of you may have heard of him before. Uh, I like to joke that he is like the Tom Brady or the Michael Jordan of entrepreneurship because he has started seven or eight different companies, four or five of which have IPO'd. Another couple have been acquired. He's on like the board of his seventh and currently running his eighth. His first company was responsible for getting comp- getting brands like ESPN on the internet, which is wild considering ESPN has their own streaming platform now. His first company got them online in the first place. He um, helped start Techstars as well. Uh, and he's the co-author of a book called The Startup Playbook. And that is a book that I recommend everyone go out and read, The Startup Playbook. Now, I had him on my podcast a few years ago, and here's what he said about messaging. He said, I think messaging is one of the most important things that startups can focus on, and it gets glossed over all the time. I think most companies fail at it, and that's probably why a lot of them actually fail overall. So if you don't take my word for it, that messaging and your voice is important, please take his word for it. And if you don't want to take his word for it, take Sean Amirati's word for it. He told me how you end up like a WordPress or a YouTube is you have your foundational elevator pitch extremely tight. It really is the core building block upon which you can build all the different communications important for your business. And what I want to underscore there is that a really good elevator pitch, he says it, that second part of that quote, it's not just that it's good as a soundbite. It's that your entire communication strategy can be built off of a really good elevator pitch. Um, Sean, he's a professor of entrepreneurship at Carnegie Mellon. He also authored a book called The Science of Growth, another book I highly recommend you go out and read. What him and his research team did was study uh, nearly identical startups in nearly identical markets at the same time and said, what were the factors? What were the things that led one to scale up and the other one to stall out? So for example, we all know YouTube today. At the same time YouTube was on the come up, there was another company called Rever. We all have YouTube as a household name today. None of us have ever heard or used Rever, you know, perhaps ever. So I highly recommend you go out and get that book. If you don't want to take his word for it, take Kayla Weisberg's for it. She's an active investor here in Chicagoland where I am. And she simply told me in a coffee meeting story is everything. Without it, we can't invest. So I hope you understand, you believe at this point that your story, your message, your pitch is important. And if you do believe that, what I would ask you to do right now in the chat is just simply type out this phrase. My product does not mean shit without a compelling story. Type that in the chat for me, if you can get on board with the idea that your pitch, your voice, your message, your storytelling is important. My product does not mean shit without a compelling story. Love it. The messages are pouring in. Love it. Love to see it. Love to see it. All right. So that said, we can all agree that this is important. At the same time, it's difficult to figure out. And we all have this shared common goal, right? Because what do we all care about at the end of the day? Money, right? We're trying to make money. We're trying to raise capital. We're trying to generate revenue. And you can even be a little bit more benevolent about this if that sounds a little bit like too like in your face and harsh. Money also equals creating jobs in the economy. Money also equals creating wealth on behalf of your family. Money also equals um, Uh, creating economic impact with your work, right? This is what we're here for. So we know this is important. We know this is what we're here for. We know that messaging, we've agreed that messaging is important. So what is it that it makes it so difficult? I think what's interesting is even knowing that this is the goal, when when it comes to figuring out our pitch, some of you said like, oh, I felt tongue-tied when you gave me that prompt earlier. Maybe you felt a little bit like this. The dog... uh... The dog, you put the food in the thing, uh, and then the dog sees it, and uh, <clears throat> food's dangling, dangling, uh, it's dangling. Uh, dog, 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 dog looks at dang, dang, tail wag, wag, uh, dog wagging the tank, or whatever dog's name is. Dog's name is Claire. Claire, come in. Uh, Claire sees dog food, pick. Facebook, like, like, like. Sizzle. Strategy. Strategy. Sex. Sex. Something. Something. 
Some, some, something. This is the worst pitch I have ever seen. Uh, I love how I love how Justin gave that one a ten. <laughs> Um, that's from the show new girl. Uh, I think it's a really like comical and funny way to, to think about what pitching can feel like. And it's an exaggeration, but perhaps, you know, that is how you feel where you're just like repeating yourself. You're almost like your tongue is swelling in your throat. Cause you don't know what to say. Right. So what is it that's holding everyone back? Well, it's something that I call the messaging treadmill. Over the years, I think at this point, I've had conversations with over 2,000 founders or brought this to 2,000 different founders, if not more. And in that time, there have been three reasons that have stood out above all else for the messaging treadmill. And I call it a treadmill because as you can see here, it's like, even though you know it's important, it's like one foot forward is one step backward. And it's, it's just always this running in place feeling. So these three reasons have come out as the top three for why this is so difficult uh, for startup founders and, and their leadership team. And they're not in any particular order. They're just the three reasons that have come out. Number one is being too in the weeds, right? Like, you know so much about your own company. You're so buried in it. It's really hard to step back and think about what does this need to sound like for someone without that much context? Number two is being too technical. Maybe you built the product. Maybe you're the product person and you know product really well, but you haven't thought or you don't know the communication of the product so much. Number three is being too caught up in the day-to-day, -day, right? You have a million other responsibilities as a founder, as a C-level person. Uh, it's really hard to be like, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to sit down and map out a messaging or a pitch strategy. And then the, what I like to call, if, this, if you bundled all this up into a gift box and tied a bow around that box, what I like to say is the inconvenient bow around the box is the fact that it's entrepreneurship and that carries its own ongoing mental crisis on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, as entrepreneurs, I think we experience the number of emotions we experience in a single day. I think it sometimes takes non-entrepreneurs an entire week, an entire month, perhaps an entire year to experience all of the emotions we experience in a day, right? You get up, you make your coffee, you're feeling pretty good. You check your email while you're making your coffee. And it's an investor saying, we're passing on you. And you're like, oh my God, that's how my day is starting off. Then you get into the office and you're like, you get an email from a potential customer being like, hey, we want to pilot your product or hey, we want to buy this many units of your product. And you're like, oh my God, yes. This is going to be a great day after all. Sweet. We can do this. Uh, another hour goes by and one of your closest team members quits on you. And you're like, oh, crap. Another hour later, there's a bug in the app and all your users are pissed off. Oh my gosh, we're going to get buried. An hour after that, you get an email from an investor saying, hey, we're interested. Let's have another meeting. Right? And on and on and on. And then three o'clock rolls around. And then all of a sudden your best customer is like, Hey, your team has been really crappy to me recently. What's going on here. And then you're like, Oh my God, I should have just listened to my family and stayed in that state, that safe, stable, secure job that paid a lot of money. Right. I had a great salary. What was I thinking? You know, and then we go home and we do this again, day in and day out somehow. Right. That's what I think makes this so difficult. We often don't even have the best impression of our own company because we know everything happening in the background. Now use the chat here, use numbers one, two, or three, or a combination of those numbers to let me know like what you feel best represents your situation. And as those are coming in, I'll let you know with Carson and fan food, the situation uh, he was in and his company was in was they were too in the weeds and too caught up in the day to day. And it looks like these reasons are resonating with you all. And then someone even put a four and a five. <laughs> so how do we get out of this treadmill mode, right? How do we, how do we reverse the process? Well, it starts with having the right mindset. And this is what I started with, with Carson and fan food. I said, okay, the first thing I want you to do and everyone here today, I want you to do as well. From this day forward, I want you to stop thinking like an entrepreneur. And instead, I want you to think like an entertainer. Why an entertainer? Because the entertainer has one goal in mind. Make an emotional connection with my audience. Get them to feel something. Have them leaving this arena buzzing with a particular energy. You know what doesn't happen? So one of my favorite artists, um, you know, is Jay-Z. 
Jay-Z doesn't perform a sellout concert by doing this. He doesn't go, he doesn't hit the stage and go, all right, how's everyone doing tonight? And everyone's like, actually it's Jay-Z. Be like, be like <laughs> yeah, how's everyone doing tonight? Oh, right. People will be like, yeah. Okay. Check it. So tonight I'm going to play every song in my entire catalog. That's a 25 year career. And I've released 16 studio albums in that time. And each, each, each album has at least 14 songs on it. Not only that, I also want to play the mixtape stuff for you and some of the working drafts. I have some things going on in the garage that I haven't fine tuned yet, but they're on our upcoming roadmap. And I want to make sure that you're aware of that. All in all, it's going to take about, and I would say 29 hours to get through the entire thing. And it doesn't really matter to me if, if you want to hear all of these songs, it's just that they're all really important to me and they're all really important to understand what Jay-Z is all about. So again, it'll take 29 hours. Who's with me, y'all? Right? Even the most diehard Jay-Z fan. <laughs> I, love, I love that Mo put just a flat out one as a response to that pitch. <laughs> right? Even the most diehard Jay-Z fan or pick your favorite artist, even the most diehard fan is not going to be like, yeah, play for 30 straight hours and don't let me leave. Right? Even the most diehard fan would be like, dude, just stick to the hits already. And that's what's happening here with entrepreneurs, right? If we think like entrepreneurs, we stay in that product focused mindset. If we think like an entertainer, instead, we have an audience oriented, an audience focused, an audience first mindset, which is why the actor will cut or the director will cut lines out of a movie script if it doesn't fulfill the larger story. The performer, right? The music artist, they will create a set list. They will curate a set list based on how they want the audience to feel by the end of it. And that set list, you know what's great about it? It gives them direction and it allows them to do a freestyle unexpectedly or do a guitar solo unexpectedly because they've got the structure, it allows for improvising in the moment. But if they go in without structure and improvise hundred percent, the whole thing is going to be a mess. And the entire set list is tight, keeps you interested from start to finish. That's what you're doing here. You're figuring out what's your set list. What, what are your greatest hits? Here's a really good example from Jay-Z himself of this idea of the entertainer mindset and being audience first. This is from a script for my Jay-Z fans in the house. If you are a Jay-Z fan, just put a capital J in the chat. Uh, maybe you'll remember this song. It's crazy because at this point, it actually came out 21 years ago uh, on his album called The Black Album. Uh, the song was called The Moment of Song was called Moment of Clarity. And he um he he used a set of lyrics to compare himself to lesser known underground rappers at the time. Uh, by the names of J, uh, by the names of Talib Kweli and Common Sense, otherwise known as Common, and he said, "I dumbed down for my audience and doubled my dollars. If skills sold, truth be told, I'd probably be lyrically Talib Kweli. Truthfully, I want to rhyme like Common Sense, but I did five mil. I ain't been rhyming like Common Sense. Now I love these lyrics because what he's saying is." Hey, I have all the capabilities, the skills, the knowledge, the smarts in the world to be that highly socially conscious, lyrically dense, intricate rapper, like the most you've ever heard. I could do that if I wanted. But I realized if I really wanted to break through to the mainstream, break out of the underground into the mainstream, I had to meet my audience where they were. And once I did that, guess what? I doubled my dollars. I did 5 million sales of a single album and I never looked back. And just in the last few years, Jay-Z became hip hop's first billionaire. And I think this is especially, I like this because, and I like him as, a, as an example, because what are we, what are like every startup founder, if you decide to do a startup, you're essentially, your goal is to break through from the underground into the mainstream. And so you got to think about what's that mainstream sound that's going to match the audience, okay? Another way you can think about this, this, graph, uh, this graphic from User Onboard that I love, um, the Super Mario graphic here, some of you may have seen this before. You're not selling the flower, right? If, if, if Small Mario is your customer and the flower is your product, you're not selling the flower. You're selling Big Mario on fire, shooting fireballs, um, stomping over Koopas, killing bad guys, right? You need to sell that at the end of the day, not the flower, not the product. You're focusing on, as it says here, awesome person who can do rad shit. 
We don't have time to watch this video, but what I recommend you do is Google, or excuse me, go to YouTube afterwards and type in Google search the reunion. Um, I'll put it in the chat here. Go to YouTube and type in Google search the reunion. It's weird because I'm asking you to go to YouTube and search Google, uh, but go to YouTube and type that in. It is an unbelievable um, commercial Google did for uh, Google India um, that I you will probably be crying by the end of it. I think it's one of the best examples of being audience first uh, and showcasing your product in a way that creates a, a particular energy uh, and leaves your audience feeling something. Thank you, Mo, for putting the direct link in there. Um, it is in Hindi, so make sure your closed captions are turned on so you get the subtitles for that. Even with subtitles alone, I, again, I, there's a good chance you're going to be crying by the end of that, or at least wiping a tear out of your eye. All right, so that's the mindset you want to have. Now let's talk about how do we actually start to get into this whole elevator pitch process. Now I want to share with you what I think is perhaps the best elevator pitch of all time. Now. Perhaps you might think it is from YouTube. It is a you know YouTube's elevator pitch, or maybe Facebook's original elevator pitch, or Tesla's, or something like that. Um, it's actually none of those. The best elevator pitch, perhaps of all time, is actually the Fresh Prince of Bel Air theme song. Now, if we were all on like the the Zoom grid view, I would have you come off mute, and we would sing this together. But since it's a one way webinar. You know, earlier I asked you to speak at your computer. Uh, I'm going to ask you on your side of the world, on your side of the screen, I'm going to sing and I'm going to ask you to join along in singing out loud with me. All right, let's sing the Fresh Prince theme together. Oh, and Lloyd, if you, if you want to come off mute and sing it with me, you of course can, but you don't have to. All right, a one, a two, a three. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down, and I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there. I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. Dun, 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 dun. In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground is where I spend most of my days, chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, and all shooting some b-ball outside of my school when a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in my neighborhood. I got in one little fight and my mom got scared. She said, you're moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air. All right, I'll end it there because I think we know we, we get the point by now. Uh, those of you who participated on your side of the world, thank you. Uh, Rob, no, you should not slap anyone. <laughs> um, don't do that. Don't do that. Will Smith before the Chris Rock incident, right? Um, so I love using this as an example, and I think it's perhaps the best elevator pitch ever, because if you really think about what he's saying here, he's giving his elevator pitch for the show, right? Hey, I had this really rough upbringing in Philadelphia, and there was a good chance if I stayed in Philadelphia, I was going to end up getting involved in a lot of bad stuff. My mom recognized this early on. And so she, she thought the best thing to do for me to fulfill my potential would be to send me over to Bel Air, California. So that way I would be, uh, have the right family structure, have access to the right education and overall the right resources at my fingertips so that I could grow into the man she knew I was capable of becoming. Right. That's what the introduction says. And because that's in the introduction, the show has context, right? You can watch episode one, you can watch episode 51, or you can watch episode 101. As long as you've seen that introduction, you will have a baseline idea of the plot for the show. Conversely, if you had never seen this introduction or heard this introduction before and you watched the show, you'd spend the entire episode trying to piece together what's the plot here. That's why this elevator pitch is so good. And 25 ish years later, you know, they haven't had an episode since a new episode since the mid 90s. It's still so memorable, right? It's telling a good story that invites us to want to learn more. And that's what your elevator pitch should do, right? It should, it should help people understand the plot. It should be the movie trailer for your company. And the movie or the episode is that longer interaction with you, whether it's a, whether it's a demo call, if, if you're a customer, um, 
or whether it is the pitch deck if you're an investor, right? Your elevator pitch should tee those things up the right way. And then I mentioned before, right? The elevator pitch really is like a foundational tool for your communication. It helps make everything else easier. And guess what? Your pitch, de- if you nail down your elevator pitch, your pitch deck is really an expansion on what you said in the elevator pitch. You can build your entire pitch deck around your elevator pitch. The other thing I want to point out here is notice how they didn't get to like season four and say, you know what? We've been doing the song a lot. People get it by now. We can stop doing the song. No, every single episode kicks off with the introduction, with the elevator pitch. Why? Because they know it's always someone else's first time watching. It might be your 50th time. It's always someone else's first time. And I share that with you because so many founders who I meet will get pitch fatigue. This particularly happens at conferences, right? So like Saster just happened, I think, was it earlier this week or was it last? I think it was earlier this week. Um, And you have all these boots out there and the majority of people at these boots, they get tired because they've been doing it. They've been giving their spiel for like 30 minutes or an hour. But just because it's your 50th time doing it, it's still that next person's first time hearing it. So you owe it to them to give it your best every single time. Another Jay-Z line that plays well here, treat my first like my last and my last like my first. That's the point here, right? You got to come in every time like it's the first time you've ever done it and like it's the last time you're ever going to do it. That level of enthusiasm, that level of attention and care to it to be able to pull in your audience. So how do we get there? Well, to create an amazing elevator pitch, we have got to get our positioning down first. And so the exercise with Carson and fan food that we started with was something I called the superhero positioning strategy. The idea here is that you have to think of your startup, your product as a superhero. Why? Because superheroes help and save people. What are you doing? You're helping and you're saving people right? You're helping, you're saving a subset of the population from something that they're experiencing. Now let's, let's like double click on that for a second. I specifically love using Batman as an example, because Batman didn't have any like cosmic nature about him. He was a person who combined technology with access to capital in order to serve the public good. Does that sound at all familiar? Huh? (laughs) Right? technology plus access to capital to serve the public good. I think that's every single one of you on this call right now. At least that's your goal is to do those two things. So pat yourself on the back for being Batman or Batwoman. When we think about Batman or a superhero, what happens that makes Batman put on the cape and come in and try and save the day? Um, Use the chat here. Like, and you can use the slide as a reference, like the graphic on the slide. Generally speaking, like what's happening in Gotham that makes Batman put on the suit to be like, oh, I need to do, I need to do something about this. Shivangi says crime. Rob says a problem. Gotham says injustice, crime. Something became too much to bear a villain. Yeah, right. All of these things. The bank is being robbed. Um, the football field is imploded. Someone's getting mugged in the street. The Joker blew up the hospital, right? All of these are reasons that make Batman put on the suit to come in and save the day. Batman does not save Gotham on a sunny day, right? If there's like nothing going on, people don't have a care in the world. They got their kids at the park. They're taking their dog for a walk. You don't see Batman swoop in and be like, whoa, I'm here to save you. Come with me. Because if he did, do you know how people would react? They would think he's a huge creep. They'd be like, "Uh, who are you? Why are you talking like that? Why are you wearing that weird cape? Stay the hell away from my children, right? They would have the exact wrong and opposite impression of Batman. Batman only saves Gotham when Gotham needs saving. Now, conversely, what I hear the majority of entrepreneurs do is start their elevator pitch by saying, We're an AI powered FinTech app. We're a machine, we're a deep machine learning, uh, a heart IOT product. 
We provide actionable uh, results for marketers using our state-of-the-art technology, right? That's what the majority, that's how the majority of entrepreneurs pitch is they lead with themselves. They try to save Gotham when Gotham doesn't need saving. And if Gotham doesn't need saving, why should they care? Why should they even listen to you? So if you are going to be a superhero, here's how I define the superhero positioning strategy. This is a formula that I developed several years back. And again, we do this first before creating an elevator pitch. This is meant to help you organize yourself internally first. In order for you, the superhero, to exist, there has to first be a person in distress. After there's a person in distress that you've identified, then you, there's a village on fire. When the village has been set on fire, you get to activate a superpower. And once your superpower is activated, then da, 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 the superhero comes in and saves the day. Or in business speak, the person in distress is your target audience. The village on fire is the core problem they are experiencing. Your superpower is your approach to that problem. And the superhero ultimately is the solution that you provide to them. This is where we started with Carson and fan food. And every startup that we work with, this is where we start. We figure out what is their market positioning first. The beauty of this strategy is you don't really need to think about competition here because you are so, you're so highly tuned into what your audience cares about. And what it does is it forces you to, to uh, be empathetic towards your audience, towards your target audience, right? It forces you to start with where are they today? before saying, well, what, what do I have that's so great? What I always tell our founders that we work with is we have to set the village on fire and burn it to the ground. And I, what I mean by that is like be, like, be concrete with the problem. Heighten it up. Don't be like, uh, you know, sometimes maybe kind of sort of they deal with this thing be more black and white about it. Like it's either their reality or it is not their reality. Um, because if you, if you try and like dance around the issue, you'll never have a message that has impact. So this is what you do first. If you're going to do this on your own, take out a piece of paper, draw four columns. Don't worry about how it sounds. Just bullet point, get the ideas out of your head. This is purely meant as an internal reference point. And this is going to help you create your elevator pitch. So my next slide I go into, I am going to um, share with you the elevator pitch formula. I want to make sure we're ready for that, though. So in the chat, go ahead and tell me, like, if you're ready to see this formula, right, pitch uh, in the chat. Pitch, 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 pitch. All right. So you take this positioning strategy and it gives you the raw data to be able to develop your elevator pitch. And the formula I'm gonna hit you with is the absolute simplest yet deadly effective pitch strategy I think you will ever come across. I call it que pasa. If any of you know Spanish, please let me know in the chat, what does que pasa mean in Spanish? Yeah, what up? What's up? Someone said WhatsApp. I think that might have been a uh, uh, autocorrect, right? What's up? What's happening? And that's what you need to do as far as your elevator pitch is concerned. You need to tell them what's up with your company. Que pasa? The acronym here is P A S A, which stands for problem, approach, solution, action. Problem, approach, solution, action, problem, approach, solution, action, problem, approach, solution, action. Okay. This is the formula. This is what we use with Carson and Fanfood. This is what we use every single time we create an elevator pitch. And again, to reiterate why this works is it forces you to provide context and frame of reference for why you should even exist and it makes you lead with empathy before talking about what it is you actually have to offer. And this formula is inherently designed to be able to get across your point in 60 seconds or less. 
Some of you may hear that and say, oh, but I don't think I can go more than 15 seconds, right? That seems like a lot. You want to be a minute or less. And I'm telling you, when you talk in this way, in this structure, you buy yourself more time. People want to keep listening. Sure, you could say a pitch shouldn't be more than 15 seconds if it's bad. But if you talk and you communicate in this framework and it's good, people are going to like be hanging on to your every word and they can't wait to hear the next sentence that you're going to say. Problem, approach, solution, action. Um, usually, the, qu- the first question people have here is the difference between approach and solution. So think of approach as your ultimate brand promise, right? It's like the big picture brand promise that you deliver. And then the solution describes that like specifically. So the solution is going to be, what's the product? How does it benefit people? Uh, Why should we care, right? Or how does it work? But the approach is some value statement that lives above all of that. Action is your call to action, right? So like, what do you want the person to do having just heard what you said? Depending on your use case, your action can be, you know, many different things. Like if this were your landing page copy on a website, which does work very great for that, your action could be click for a demo, okay? I'm going to show you three examples now, including Carson and Fan Foods example, all right? Um, I'm just gonna quick address this problem or this question that's put in the chat. Uh, We struggle with our big problem, the macro movement we address versus the small problems we solve in the weeds. Any tips? More specifically, how to pick the right problem? Really good question, Shane. Figure out, go back to the superhero strategy and under your village on fire, identify what are all the micro problems. And then from that, almost always, one of those things is a lead that the others are a trickle down effect from. Almost always, that's the case. So what's that uniting thing that everything else happens because of this core problem? Okay, hope that helps. Let me show you a few different examples now using KPASA. Uh, the first company I want to show you with is Cyber Pop-Up. So Christine Iswakor is the founder and CEO of this company. Um, they were um, building out their product and they wanted to get on the map with their message and had this vision to enter a lot of pitch competitions. Um, to be able to get their name out there, maybe maybe raise some money through winning pitch competitions. Um, so we built this elevator pitch. And again, remember, the elevator pitch enables everything else. So this helped create the pitch deck then too. And here's what cyber pop-up is all about being in the cybersecurity industry. Your server was hacked. You failed an audit. Your latest software update is vulnerable. Cybersecurity is serious business. It's also highly specialized. So why would you find an expert from the same place your marketing team gets their freelance graphic designers? And a traditional consulting firm takes you through a sales process that lasts months, but you needed someone for the job like yesterday. Approach. Get vetted specialists in a fraction of the time at a time when you need it most with cyber pop-up. Submit your project and get started as early as the same day. We manage the team and verify all your requirements are met So you get the highest quality delivery without the headaches. Cybersecurity isn't a matter of if, but when. So when it hits the fan, go to cyberpopup.com. Capital letter C in the chat. If you have a baseline understanding of how Cyber Popup would provide value to its target audience of cybersecurity professionals or businesses who have cybersecurity uh, problems, right? It's like easier to understand because of this formula. And the better you get at articulating the problem, as you can see, the less you have to actually say about the solution because it starts to become inherently implied or understood. Um, I also think that the better you get at articulating the problem, the more your audience starts thinking about what the solution would be. So then by the time you actually say what your solution is, Now it actually sounds more like a reinforcing thought that they started to have before you even said it, right? It's kind of this like Jedi mind trick. So it's like they were thinking about it before you said it, and then you said it, and it reminded them of what they were just thinking about. So it's going to feel better as a result. So they didn't even have their product built yet. And I call 2021 the year of Christine and the year of cyber pop-up. These were like the the emails I was getting over, over the course of the year. 
Hey, sidebar, won 20K in a competition yesterday. Won another competition, 5K, whoop, whoop. 100K win. The next weekend, another 100K win. So much so that she started getting media attention with all the pitch competitions she was winning. And then this actually started getting investors interested. And, and she started getting into her seed round conversation because of these things, right? I think in total last year, she won $250,000 in pitch competitions alone. That's pretty damn cool considering she didn't even have a functioning product yet. And it all started with Kpasa. Let me show you honest game, okay? Um, we talked before about how the elevator pitch is the foundation for all your communication. Well, with Honest Game, they took the elevator pitch and turned it into a product video. So here's how this turned out. And it opens with the problem. Okay, it opens with an ad. Hey, do you ever walk <laughs> into a room and completely forget why you're there? Okay, yeah, totally. skip ad. First voiceover will be the problem. When you're a star high school student athlete, you compete tirelessly on the court and in the classroom to achieve your one dream of playing in college. Top schools recruit you and even offer you a scholarship. Then senior year hits and you find out that the class you took actually doesn't count. Your GPA is .25 off or your SAT score is 10 points too low. Even with the experts in your corner, school counselors, parents, and coaches, athletic eligibility rules can be confusing to navigate. And often by the time you find out you're ineligible, it's too late to catch up. Boom. Game over. Approach. Honest Game is the clear pathway for getting in. Solution. We automate the process so the student, the parent, the coach, the counselor, and the college all get real-time eligibility updates. With Honest Game, everyone knows what to do before it's too late. And I'm going to cut it there for the, in the interest of time because it goes a little bit longer just um, hitting on some stats for the purpose of the video use. Um, but capital letters HG in the chat. If you have a baseline understanding of how honest game would be useful and valuable to high school student athletes and the entire uh, student athlete ecosystem, right? Look at that. Now, when they first came to us, they were like, Kim and Joyce were like, we both say wildly different things. We always confuse people. It's pretty frustrating. We have this big picture impact we want to create, but whenever we communicate it, no one understands what we're doing. So we applied k -Pasa, built that elevator pitch. The pitch deck became easier as a result. And ultimately, this was really cool. They entered this pitch competition sponsored by the Chicago Bulls. Um, and 220 companies applied. 20 were selected as semifinalists to pitch. They made it into the top 20 out of 220 companies. Out of that top 20, a top five were selected as finalists to pitch on center court at the United Center where the Bulls play. Honest Game made it into that top five. And at the time, they had like five unpaid beta users or beta customers. They weren't even making revenue yet. They went up against four other companies that were revenue producing, some of whom, if I recall, were doing six-figure monthly revenue. Those five companies pitched. The next night at the first time out of the Bulls home game, they surprise announced the winner on court. And guess who walked away with a $50,000 check from the Chicago Bulls and the investor group Loud Capital Honest Game, right? I'm telling you like this, it's, it's so wild how effective this can be if you put it to use. David asked if you can post a link to that video. Uh, I can here, let me just... I gotta, it might not, it might be like a restricted video based on like user, but if it's not, it, uh, see if that link works for you. Okay. What about Carson and fan food? Let's come back to them. You remember what their pitch was like before. Now let's see what their pitch turned into applying K Pasa. As a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating than going to your favorite team's game and missing the big play because you were stuck waiting in line for a hot dog and beer. Fan food keeps you in the moment. Use our mobile ordering app and get your concession food delivered directly to your seat so you never miss a big play again. Download fan food in the app store today. 
capital letters FF, if you now understand what fan food does. And what I love about this pitch is that if you're, if you are a sports fan, you can visualize when this has happened to you, right? Any sports fan knows the exact game you've been at and the play you've missed because you were stuck in a line waiting for a beer or a hot dog or whatever it might be, right? That's how effective this is. So let's talk about where did this get them, right? What is the effect of great storytelling? The K-Pasa method was applied to their elevator pitch. We were able to build their pitch deck around it. Let's look at how Carson changed from before and after. Hey there. My name is Carson Goodell, CEO and uh, co-founder of Fan Food. Now, as a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating when you're at your team's game than missing a big play because you were stuck waiting in a line for a hot dog and beer. Fan Food keeps you in the moment. Our mobile ordering app brings concessions directly to your seat, so you never have to miss the big play. Now, we are currently live in five venues in three different states, our two largest being a major league soccer venue and the Formula One Raceway down in Austin, Texas. Download our app today on the iOS and Android store. Swagger, confidence, right? He knew what he was saying. And, and, you know, I told you at the beginning that whole, like, I don't like being put on the spot thing. I put him on the spot this day. I showed up at their office and I didn't tell him beforehand. I just showed up and I was like, Hey, I'm going to put you on camera. Let's do your pitch. And he knew it so well that he was able to do it on the spot. The only downsides were that, cause he didn't know I was coming. He was like last minute. He was like, Oh, should I wear a, a branded shirt for this? And so he threw it on over his collared long sleeve, which is like a kind of weird look. Uh, and then, uh, also I walked too fast with the camera. And so he like started to run out of breath, trying to talk and walk at the same time. And notice how that was a 44 second pitch. His first one was like 19 or 20 seconds, but the 44 second pitch is more effective than the 19 second one. And so where did all of this get them? Well, out of the gate, they won a thousand dollars in a competition. Then they won $25,000. They actually used that video as part of their submission to get in. That $25,000, not only did they win, but it came with an afternoon strategy meeting with Damon from Shark Tank. They then did a successful crowdfund, raised a roughly $3 million Series A, scaled their team up, and now they have customers in the NCAA, Formula One, MLS, Minor League Baseball, Major League Baseball, and more. At the time when we were working on that, being Chicagoans, we were like, this would be so cool to be in Wrigley Field someday. And then last year on opening day, fan food was installed in, in Wrigley Field, uh, in their luxury suites. That is the power of really good pitching. The last two things I will leave you with here as we start to run out of time. Um, here's what Carson said. He mentions my, he mentions our name in it. I'm not showing you this because he mentions our name, but I want you to take his advice to heart. One of the most underrated skills as an entrepreneur is authentic storytelling. Developing this skill without a doubt has made me a stronger entrepreneur. So I want you to come away from this believing and knowing that this is a vital skill to your success. Um, Lloyd, I know we're over time. Um, I usually have this at the end. If we do have time after they raised money on his birthday, I did a quick like minute long rap that I put on LinkedIn for him. Um, Roll it. Let's, let's close it out with your rap. This should was we, okay. I had a ton of fun. I learned a ton um, great knowledge bombs, man. We're going to get it on the YouTube and the podcast in by the end of next week, but Perfect. let's close it out with this for the audience. Perfect. And everyone, if you do have to jump right now, here's my contact info, that QR code. If you want to meet with us and talk about your pitch, scan that QR code and it'll take you directly to a Calendly page. Uh, please connect on LinkedIn as well and just check out our podcast. We just had Lloyd on earlier this week. So just type in startup hype man on, uh, on any podcast app. Uh, yeah, right. hey, hey, Raj, drop drop your LinkedIn as well. And folks, the recordings will, as always, be on these, these channels. Um, uh, let's, uh, Raj, drop your uh, LinkedIn as well. I'm going to drop it, actually, for ease. Yeah, Meanwhile, please. you can roll that, roll that to close it out. All right. So... I'm rapping about the damn dude behind fan food. Yeah, the man who does everything that you can't do. Wait, 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 wait. Let me start over. I don't like that. Yo, 
I'm rapping about the damn dude behind fan food. Yeah, the man who does everything that you can't do. That's true. Now peep him though, the CEO agreed to make a heap of dough. Achieving it, you see the road and dreaming big but sleeping no. And even though he's local now, believe in me, the team will grow and feed the meats at every meat. That's what I call hemoglobin. <laughs> Not done. Keep me flowing. Carson is here for the ship. So let's keep it rowing. An entrepreneur, they used to look at him like, dude, you want to be sure. The B student raised the Series A. Now they call him up like, I hear you getting paid. Selling into sports arenas? Huh. Go and drink the hater raid. If you doubted him then, now, you ain't worth his data rate. He just turned 25. And what you're doing now, it could work. Or, honestly, it could fail. But I prefer to be an optimist. So Carson, I say we celebrate with, well, what else but a good ale. His last name is Good Ale. That's the pun. <laughs> And that, that is, is the Carson great. birthday Car Carson, rap. good ale. Good ale. Awesome, folks. Thank you so much, Raj, for joining us. This was great fun. You kept it entertaining. Everyone's having a laugh there. And that's the thing, right? The best way to engage people is to entertain them. <laughs> yes. If, 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 hey, Nirvana said it 30 years ago, right? Here we are now. Entertain us. <laughs> entertain us. If you can't, um, you, you can't not be... Uh, or, or I guess you won't be bored if you're hooked, right? Yes, exactly. You can't fall asleep if you're hooked. So get entertained people with your pitch. Thank you so much, folks. Love and peace. Have a nice weekend. Thank you, everyone. I need some traction.